the, the biggest question is, what is consciousness? And how does it work? How, how do we develop it? Uh, and so that's a central aspect to my theory of everything, is the integration of our understanding of consciousness into the model. Uh, <clears throat> most modern science views consciousness as what they call an epiphenomena, which means kind of a side effect, and yet our, our direct experience completely argues against that. In, in, in statistics, what we call the grandmother test, it says if, if your grandmother can tell you, you know, which, which treatment worked, you don't need statistics. Well, we can tell the scientists that, that consciousness does affect the world. It's not just an effect of the world. We have an effect on our lives, ourselves, our actions, uh, the people around us. Um, so, so consciousness is obviously a very active principle in existence, in life. Uh, I, as I see it, consciousness is uh, an underlying principle of all existence, not just something that magically appears after a certain level of complexity of neurological development happens randomly. Uh, and, and I think there's very good reasons for, for looking at it that way. Uh, as uh, a magnesium atom, I mentioned in an earlier program, doesn't forget how to be magnesium. It has perfect, perfect memory. We call this angelic consciousness, angelic memory. Uh, and we then, if we look at all existence as angelic in nature, defining an angel as a thought of the creator, uh, that we are communities of, an of these angels. There's hierarchies in the traditional understanding of angels. It's a hierarchical uh, universe of, of angelic nature. And so we are sovereign kings and queens over these angelic communities of the biological vessel in which we have this human experience. And uh, there's a, a, an angelic mineral substrate to that conscious body that inhabits the biological body. In, in traditional uh, Chinese philosophy and medicine, uh, it's called the Jing. Uh, uh, it's stored in the kidneys. We, we inherit it from our ancestors. It's something that, that is easy to dissipate with, uh, with abuse, with, with stress in our lives, uh, but with effort and, and uh, intention and clarity in our lives and, and health, we can actually build the gym. And, and they describe it as being breathed in through the lungs. So this is fascinating to me because that uh, fits very much with the concept of, of the modern concept scientifically of condensate. Uh, not, that, not that science yet fully understands the, all the, the, the ramifications and, and the types of presence of condensates, but uh, the, uh, high, the orms, the high spin nucleus atoms of the, uh, the platinum palladium uh, group of transition elements that uh, David Hudson patented back in 1996 uh, fit very much the, the, the picture that they carry consciousness. That's the experience of people who interact with these minerals. Uh, they, they fit the description of, of the, the stones, the book of the law that, that Moses brought down from the mountain uh, that uh, modern tradition holds and through the last uh, couple thousand years, the tradition in, in Ethiopia is that, that, that from my reading of the little information that's available, I've been able to find on it, that one of those two books apparently is, is still being held in, in a, uh, a sanctuary in Ethiopia. And that uh, it's the presence of God it, because it's an annealed glass of this form of mineral that forms the soul uh, in, in a gaseous condensate form, in, in the case of the soul. Uh, that the, uh, this would be the the white powder, gold, the, the uh, of of alchemy. The uh, you know the, the misconception about alchemy typically is that 
alchemists try to make gold out of lead. It's something that the alchemists have attempted and, and perhaps have done, but it's not the highest goal of alchemy. What's called the philosopher's stone, the white powder of gold or perhaps these other transition metals elements in a non-metallic state, but a superconducting state, a superfluid state, if they're in a gaseous form, uh, where their description is that it's, 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 it's an evolution that takes place between the alchemist and the, the substance of the philosopher's stone, that they co-create, co-evolve each other, because they're both conscious. But the, the stone by its nature, uh, again being the substrate of consciousness of, of how we can have sensory experience, conscious experience is that we have this nature. What is a substrate of consciousness? Substrate means the carrier. Like if you have information or data and you want to store it, well, you need a substrate. You need a, a computer chip. You need a, a data bank of, that has some physical nature to hold it, yeah, whether it's a crystal or a, or, or a magnetic tape or a punch card or the, the paper in the punch card is the substrate. It's the carrier. Um, so in this case, it's the carrier that, that has, by its nature, a connection with the divine or the non-local. Uh, it's, according to David Hudson's patented work, it's four-ninths of its mass is not here now. It's not measurable as mass anymore. It's in another form. It's non-local. Uh, and that means it can have its presence as uh, I, I model it as a wormhole, just like how I model how photons work, as a wormhole from one point in space-time to another, and that could be a point in the a remote, distant uh, point in space in the same time. So we can be connected to another person through love. If, if I care for a person, I think about them, I'm connected to them across space to where they are now in real time through that wormhole of photonic, of photonic energy and similar in the, the case of the condensate minerals, only that is a larger substrate than a, than a photon, so it's going to be a larger wormhole. And if we have a coherent spirit body well, and it's connected in that way, that's going to create a larger wormhole. The descriptions of Christ opening, opening the, the gates of heaven would explain much if, if that wormhole that we could, with which we could connect to heaven, like, for example, the Buddha in meditation, was able to foresee many things, including Christ, who he, he called uh, a just man. He, he could identify that there was this man, and he answered his, his followers, no, it's not me. But he was close enough to see that, but not close enough according to the, the uh, the Christian tradition and understanding, not close enough to actually pass through that wormhole and, and enter into the fullness of bodily presence in, in the, the heavenly future realm, uh, the, the realm of potential and possibility that's not limited by our linear experience of time. I model it as a, a planar, a two-dimensional time uh, where there's all possibility opens up, you know, more than one possibility opens up. Multiple lines of, of experience can be simultaneous. Kind of like how people experience uh, on the threshold of that, out-of-body experiences, uh, near-death experiences. In a good number of cases, uh, people experience a, a life review where, where their whole life comes flooding back to them and the sense of it is not not as if it's one thing after another, but some more simultaneously, where the time becomes a two-dimensional realm when we unplug from the, the biological body, where we're tapping into the space-time experience of developing our, our consciousness through and developing our will as, the, as sort of the rudder, the, the guide to our navigation in experiential space. So uh, when I came across the Oriental model uh, of, of consciousness development, spiritual development, it was really fascinating for me because it, it all started 
fitting into place beautifully with, with what I know from Western science of development of uh, sensory, cognitive, motor uh, abilities. Uh, and so the, it's like having a 3D vision of something when you have two models, both of which work, like you know, Western and Eastern sciences. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I've been trained, for example, in, in SOI, Structure of Intellect uh, model, based on J.P. Guilford's work in psychology, where he looked at intelligence as a dynamic function, not, a, not with the, the limited, limiting idea that intelligence was something that we could really characterize by a single number and say that that was somehow, you know, predetermined by genetics, perhaps. Uh, you know, your IQ score is, is this, and that's what it'll always be, and, you know, so you're smarter, you're dumb, and just accept that. No, he looked at it as, well, that we all have intelligence. We have different kinds of intelligence. So he was interested to say, well, what are those kinds of intelligence? And so he began dividing up the space of intelligence into a three-dimensional space and looking at the coherence of what are the structural units within that space. Those structural units, the dimensions he looked at were, because he was coming from an intelligence psychology basis, which is about pr predictive uh, value for academic function, it was, it was figural, symbolic, and semantic. Figural, like a picture, a drawing, a, an object. Figural could be you know, uh, 3D, 2D, uh, symbolic. Now it's it's there's there's some figuralness to it, the, the shape of a letter A, but it stands for something like a sound or a symbol for uh, apple or a symbol for some physics variable in an equation, uh, and semantic being words and language, and there's different levels of structure that. Uh, which would be units, classes, like un a, a semantic unit would be a word. Vocabulary would be cognition of semantic units. And interestingly, in, in my work in, in vision development, uh, which there was an interface with, with his work, mm -hmm. their studies showed that when children went through vision development stimulation, optometric vision therapy in this study, uh, that the, the, the aspect, many aspects of intelligence improved, but the one that improved the most, they were surprised, they didn't expect. It was cognition of semantic units. Improving vision, our ability to gather light information about our external environment, about the things out there, and, and what came out in the intelligence was our ability to identify and label and name those things. So be able to discern and discriminate and, and make relationship and meaning, to create meaning out of what we see. Uh, as uh, I remember Robert Kraskin, a uh, well-known optometrist in Washington, D.C., who worked with uh, one of President John Johnson's uh, daughters, became a vision therapist in, in his office. And uh, Dr. Kraskin would, would uh, remind us that that uh, vision is the deriving of meaning from a selected uh, range of frequencies of light. So it's not just what we think of as eyesight, the ability to see, but when we say I see, we mean the fullness of I understand, I've gained meaning. Okay? If we just see, like in the research, uh, I think it was Wiesel at, at, at Harvard with the cats, uh, development of the cats, they'd have two cats attached to the same harness and one cat would be able to actively move and the other would be moved passively by the motion of the other cat so that they designed the environment so that the two cats would receive identical visual stimulation. But in one case, they were actually regulating and controlling that input through movement so it's a feedback loop. In the other case, it was an open loop, just pure visual stimulation with no control over it. And they found that the cats who had no control over their stimulation were functionally blind. 
they could they acted as if they couldn't see anything. Well, they couldn't. They couldn't understand what it was and what to do about it. They, they hadn't learned. There's a, a Dr. Jerry Getman who helped to develop developmental optometry, and uh, he would say that, that vision develops under the tutelage of active touch. That we first, you know, an infant pick something up, they feel it with their fingertips, and then bring it to their mouth and feel it with the mouth, and, and, through the, and they're seeing that the whole time, and through seeing, they begin to understand the visual meaning of visual textures, that they correspond, correlate to those tactile textures, and ultimately we learn to project that, project our visual understanding to remote distances, where we can look across the room and see the texture of uh, a block of wood or a piece of carpet, and we can feel it in our mind. Uh, and and the, the ancient Greeks uh, proposed, and, and I think I'm seeing that they were right on a quantum level, that vision, the actual act of vision, the ray goes from the eye to the object. When we look at that block of wood and we're feeling its texture, we're actually connecting through our conscious body with a photon, a, making a wormhole, where we have literally a, a, a little tentacle of connection across space with that object. Uh, in physics, we can see it as you know, the, the shocking surprise to quantum physicists when they come to realize that the quantum of light doesn't exist until they look at it. It's actually what we create. The quantum I see as a wormhole. A wormhole implies another wormhole at the end of the, the, the tunnel. The wormhole connection between those two entry points, stargates, you might say, on a sub-microscopic level. And I see them as being transdimensional. That's, they're they're non-local. That means non-local not only in space, but also potentially non-local in time. When we have a memory, what is that? How can I see? How can my spirit body see that which is not present here now? It's non-local information. It's a wormhole through space and time to that which I saw once in my past. Uh, and, and in the same way, we can, we can alter that structure of that consciousness with our thinking, with our mind, visualizing. Uh, we can alter, the, if we've seen a, uh, an elephant and we've never seen a white elephant, as soon as I say white elephant, we can visualize a white elephant because we have the capacity in, in consciousness to recombine experiences that we've had once we've had that, those experiences. Uh, so we, in the same way, we can project something into the future when we visualize and intend or uh, you know, make an act of the will that we're going to create something and if we can see it, if we can visualize it, uh, it's very powerful if we write it down.